Okay. Um, you ready? Yeah. Uh, All right. About, why don't you give me an occupation? Uh, how about 86 steel workers? 86 steel workers walk into a bar. The bartender says, sorry, we don't serve your kind here. The steel workers say, that's fine. We're not here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we know that there's a place in the arts community for Shakespeare. We know there's a place for ballet. Is there a place for comedy? I mean, people in Pittsburgh are very, very open to amazing, interesting, weird things. The Pittsburgh comedy scene has grown so much in the last few years. There are so many families in the region thirsty for, for new things to do. I think that this city has shown there is a place for it, and not only are there artists here that want to do it, there are audiences that want to watch it. I'm Louis Stein, and I was the fourth host of Friday Night Improvs. And I'm Ben Mayer, and I was the fifth host of Friday Night Improvs. Friday Night Improvs was Pittsburgh's only all-audience participation comedy improv show and started in 1989. And if you're wondering what improv is, well, as you can see, we've gotten kind of old and we don't remember, so we're going to throw it to super awkward 1990s Ben Mayer to tell you all about it. Improvs is a show, and it's different than other kind of shows because the audience actually puts on the show. The people get up on stage, and they entertain the rest of the audience. Everyone comes in here with nothing prepared, and you make up stuff off the top of your head, and hopefully it's funny, and everyone laughs, and they're entertained. Susquehanna Hat Company, Cellar Dwellers, No Parking Players. Ever heard of those guys? Probably not. And that's because the improv scene was pretty underground in the 1990s. For a lot of these troops, to find a place to perform, they had to go to art galleries, small underground theaters, or even coffee shops. There was no permanent home for improvisational comedy. It was inevitable that all these underground troops would find each other and come together. And they did, at the Pittsburgh Improv Jam, at the Cabaret Theater downtown. With that show performing downtown, improvisational comedy was finally ready to come out of the underground and onto a larger stage. And Pittsburgh has never been funnier. Really, that's how you're gonna end this out? What, like you had something better to say? I could have said something about the Johnstown flood would have been funnier. <laughs> Are you guys ready for your headliner? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, here we go. Listen, y'all in for a treat. Your headliner, Norlex Bellman, everyone. This is kind of cliche to say, but comedy is really hard. <laughs> My name is Norlex Belma, and I am a stand-up comedian. And we have still not put a black man on The Bachelor. Oh. Let them put a black man on The Bachelor, I guarantee you. That's the last damn season of The Bachelor. <laughs> I think Pittsburgh is a great place uh, to do stand-up and also to help uh, foster a budding stand-up scene. We've had more venues as well as a lot more performers who are taking it seriously. So now we're getting attention from other cities. Performers from other cities want to come here and perform. We're starting to really get, get our name up and it's been great to watch. What did my non-employed, unenrolled friends do every day, all day? And I now have the answer to that question. Drugs. That's what I was. I moved here uh, at 17 years old from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I went to music school at Carnegie Mellon University. Before music, I never did stand-up. I never uh, did anything uh, solo with the microphone. Interesting story. My stand-up debut was technically me roasting my mother at her 40th birthday party, and they stuck a microphone in my hand. I just started going off, but no real stand-up experience. <laughs> I wasn't satisfied with orchestral music anymore, and my friends prompted me to go on stage. You should try it. I went up, did 15 minutes, and I realized this is what I need to be doing. And I spent my whole life performing with a horn in my hand or playing piano. So I had to get used to the idea of my body being the instrument and uh, using that to go and make people understand what I was trying to say. Hopefully it was funny. My favorite thing about the public bus is observing bus psychology. I can tell who's late getting where they have to go by their reaction 
when the wheelchair guy gets on the bus. <laughs> a comic's first open mic is really stressful. Um, it's kind of getting just thrown in the deep end of things. But it's a culture that you don't understand unless you're in it. But for me personally, uh, I really just said, okay, the only way to get better is like music. You have to practice. So I have to come out to these open mics as often as possible. A lot of people think that the work that is easy is just getting up on stage. Uh, if you're serious about it, it takes a lot of time. Watching myself, rewriting, editing, writing again. All I do is work on comedy, perform comedy, watch comedy, work on comedy. It allows me to be creative and allows me to invest time in myself. Um, it's a job. Black Lives Matter is going up on and taking over the Bernie Sanders yeah, rally. And more so. I was watching a Dick Clark interview, and then uh, I was watching Ryan Seacrest's interview, and they both said uh, the best experience for them was starting out in radio. And we said, we're going to have a weekly uh, topical talk show talking about all the things that happen in the world or in America, but from the specific point of view of black millennials. Sometimes I play my stand-up for an hour. Uh, it's really allowed me to just uh, get creative and put that out on the airwaves. I'm really enjoying it. My material comes from a lot of places. Like, black women will salute a black woman who dates white men. They treat her like she got out. Things that I, I want people to talk about that I don't feel like are being spoken about enough. Yeah, Todd looked fiscally responsible. <laughs> Jerome over here put bologna on layaway last week. One of the things that I have to uh, deal with is uh, the expectations of being a young black male comedian. Obviously, 90s and the, and the Def Jam era kind of set the table to what people think uh, comedy coming out of a young black man from an urban environment is supposed to sound like. I don't give you that, but you also see that I'm rooted in that. I think comedy is about standing out. I know that sometimes the material that I do can make uh, white people uncomfortable. White people can't say the N-word. Did you know that, sir? Yeah, you did. Yeah. You said that very quickly. I'm still alive, right? Of course I knew that. I did. It's okay. I kind of use comedy to make you uncomfortable to make you comfortable again. White people can't say the N-word just like black men can't say, F*** you, officer. <laughs> and you're no longer uncomfortable, you're actually a little more aware. Oh, we're both gonna be on a spray-painted t-shirt the next morning. <laughs> and then by the end of the joke, hopefully, that thought sets in. One phrase that I like to use in my own head is, anybody can get it. I definitely wanna force people to think through comedy. I gotta spend a lot more nights in a lot more clubs, a lot more cities, and a lot more states before I can get to that. More like Spelma! Hey, one more time. I remember hearing an interview with Conan O'Brien once. He said something like, I would love if somebody at home watching my show could have it on mute and they still would laugh at times. Yeah. And I think of that sometimes with our Frankly Scarlet shows that we're here to entertain. We are Frankly Scarlet. To my left is Rob Hitchcock. To my right is Liz Lavaz and I'm Abby Fewer. And we are a all-female sketch group. When we were thinking about forming, it was kind of a different time, uh, at least in Pittsburgh, in terms of the amount of women we were seeing on stage at comedy events. There were only 40 people in the room, and two of them were women. So there wasn't just an absence of female comedy in Pittsburgh. There was just so little sketch comedy going on. And that's how I first started to love comedy. You two had been talking for years about getting together an all-female group to sort of counteract this overwhelming maleness of the community at the time. We come from, you know, four years of drama school and wanting to have, like, this is the correct prop, this is the correct costume. Let's merge those two. Yeah. I want to see the spectacle that I see at plays merged with the wittiness of these really funny people that I know. You wrote some sketches of your own and we got a stage in, in 2012. We had our first show. We've been performing together ever since. By virtue of there being less women in uh, these improv scenes, we used to joke that we saw the same male scenes over and over again. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a dad and a son in the woods. It's two astronauts talking about their wives. Right. And so we, we, another big part of Frankly Scarlet Forming was 
there were scenes and parts of life that maybe are a little bit more the female perspective that we weren't seeing. Absolutely. And that, and so I think going back to this idea of women being uh, comfortable being aggressive and being mm -hmm. competitive. The other thing is, you know, with Sketch saying like, hey, this is my viewpoint of life and it's absolutely just as important and worthy as two male spies right. talking about their guns, and you know? it's not just for women. Right. Yeah. Sketches that are informed by being a woman. The same way that we can laugh at two men in a male subject matter sketch, men can laugh at our perspective of the world because it's equally as witty and it's yeah. equally as funny. We try to get our sketches at the highest level. We've got video, we've got the best props we can possibly make, the best costumes we can throw together from what's in our closets. Choreography, we love dancing. Sure do. We'll have uh, slides, Songs. you know, singing, dancing, performing. We yeah. try to be triple threats. So I was actually out of the city for a few years, and when I came back, it was like night and day. There's just so much more happening in Pittsburgh with comedy. There's so many more people. All kinds of shows are happening in all kinds of venues. And with more people and more types of shows in the community, you see more women. It's not just more performers, it's bigger audiences. Yeah. And audiences that aren't just performers. People right. are coming to be entertained. <laughs> and when I stand on stage and I don't know all the people in the audience, that's the most rewarding. I think Pittsburgh has definitely advanced a lot in terms of women in comedy, but it's still not perfect. There is a competitiveness that is encouraged in men. I, I feel like a lot fewer women feel comfortable doing that. We felt that this was something that the city needed, something that the city wanted, something that we wanted, and it's been such, such a cool thing to see how the city has grown with comedy. One, two, three, it's all right. Okay. 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 It's a birthday. Yes. You have saved this world again. <laughs> Thank you so much. It gets harder every time. <laughs> you, you are the champion of all champions to Yoshimi. I discovered improv probably that I think most general public does, is like, whose line is it anyways? Watching that in college, I discovered it in Pittsburgh by starting to volunteer at the Arcade Comedy Theater as a technician. And that's where I realized that, oh, people that are just regular people do this, not just people on TV. So I started taking classes and I perform way more than I tech anymore. My name's Dave Hart and I'm an improviser. So I've always been very outgoing. I'm a people person, I do like people. Uh, I was born with congenital heart disease, so I've had surgeries here and there throughout my life. I started getting like faulty shocks from my defibrillator. Whatever that did to me as I was going through that made me really uncomfortable in situations I couldn't control and I started getting kind of like anxiety panic attacks from that. So that's why I stuck to myself at home. It was a controlled environment. That's been the nice thing that improv has done for me is it's helped me control how I think about things. It helps me really understand myself. I say that improv is my therapy. I get to just let it all out on stage. It was about remembering how to play. It teaches you acceptance. It helps you listen more. I started realizing these are just skills that I should translate to my job and my home life. Uh, all right, ready? Uh, big booty, big booty, big booty. Big booty number four. I manage a bunch of people. Most of their job is customer service. So you take the first basic parts of improv and it makes for a great recipe to have people have a smile on their face and enjoy what they're doing. It helps you connect on a different level and it just, it adds a little bit more to a conversation that us as human beings are gonna be like, this person was paying attention to me. When it comes to improv kind of home-wise, it was just remembering those things. I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself, it's listening. So for me, improv is important because it translates to every aspect of my life. I think what makes improv special to Pittsburgh is the environment. So the fact that you have a theater that's downtown, I know there's performance spaces in Lawrenceville, some over in East Liberty area. 
there's something everywhere for you and that's the key. When I started, it was the same group every night. Just two years later, I probably don't know 80% of the people because there are so many different classes, there's so many different, different performers and shows and groups and independent stuff. I feel like the demographic that's being pulled into this are your younger 20 to 30 somethings. You know, it helps meet new people. So I think that's a big part that makes Pittsburgh special. So it really kind of brings that community together. You're just gonna give that to her? Oh, not just that. We also have some pie. So the thing to keep in mind is that I live a normal life. I have a wife and a kid, I go to a full-time job, and I come home and I wash the dishes and I play with the dogs and play with the daughter. But improv is something that just helps me be a better version of myself. And for that, I'm grateful. I love improv. And I personally learned that improv can really help you socially connect with other people and open up to other people. And I decided maybe improv would be a really good tool to help kids, of course, and to help people with special needs learn how to open up and communicate more, too. I'm Tessa Carroll, and I use comedy as a teaching tool. I signed up for improv in the first place because I couldn't make all of my friends just play make-believe games with me all the time. I felt really lucky that I found the Steel City Improv Theater with other adults who wanted to play with me too, and we kind of self-selected and found each other. Got a special education degree at the University of Pittsburgh, and now I'm teaching special education. I also run the Penny Arcade comedy show. It's a family show and it's targeted for children between the ages of two and 12. We do a variety of things with kids in comedy. Whoa! <laughs> we have collaboration stations at the start of the show. So you can come in for the first 20 minutes of the show and go to one of four or five stations and give us ideas such as character names, settings you can draw, pictures of your favorite lands or dream places on a big paper behind the stage. Or you can give us dialogue. Sometimes we have costumes that you can glue funny eyeballs on and glitter and the improvisers will wear the costumes during the show. So basically, we take all of your ideas at the collaboration station and then we play improv games. The majority of the show is made up of what the kids come up with at the collaboration station. So every single show is an absolutely new show. It's our hope that the kids get to see that their ideas create a story. It's kind of creating a literary uh, journey together. They might not really know it, but they're they're writing stories by giving us elements of stories for the show. All the hey. space means red. Very red. Kids can just see that their ideas are valued by adults and by everybody. They can put the silliest or funnest or smartest character name that they want on the piece of paper, and we're going to use that idea in our show. We really hope that kids understand that we take their ideas seriously and that their ideas are capable of making great art. I'm going to tap somebody on the shoulder and that's going to be the person who moves. You'll start making really small movements and the person across from you will be starting to mimic those movements. Laughter can be really healing. Improv has really been proven to be a really good tool to help people become more comfortable with one another and open up. It really can be especially helpful for people who have special needs, in particular people who have autism. Hence, the organization that I started called Open Up Pittsburgh. I think they could really benefit with getting to be more playful with one another. And so I use improv to do that. Switch hands, keep looking around the circle. One, two, three. There's so many improv games that can allow you to be playful but are sneaking in the, the added benefit of social skills and the added benefit of helping you become more brave and, and learning how to communicate better. 
So Pittsburgh is a really great place to be trying to nurture and build interconnected communities in the arts. It is a small enough city. There are so many families in the region just looking and thirsty for, for new things to do. And the fact that improv is not just is not just a creative outlet, but that it really has all these enriching side benefits, like, like the interpersonal skills and the social skills, makes this really um, a, a wonderful art to be bringing to our city. It's really important that it grows for everybody. I've seen people grow from improv. I've seen children grow from improv. I've seen people with special needs grow from improv, and that's inspiring to me every day. Three, two, one. I think what we do is so different. Now wait a second, that is so discriminatory against goblins, I don't even know where to start. I remember specifically the first show went really well. We make it more of an improv thing that really involved the audience. I describe it to a lot of people as almost the match game, but with Dungeons and Dragons. So we're a Dungeons and Dragons themed comedy show. Sort of improv, sort of not. So we're playing Dungeons and Dragons on stage. So for those of you who have never played Dungeons and Dragons before, essentially it's a group of players who get together. Uh, one of them acts as the dungeon master who describes the setting and the actions that, uh, that they're doing, the objects that they're interacting with, and everybody else is role playing a character. They decide what they want to do at any given moment, and it all comes down to the role of a 20 sided die. A 20 is an automatic success, a 1 is an automatic failure. So Fred is the dungeon master and we each play different characters. My character is a dwarf fighter. Um, we have a kung fu monk, we have a bard, we have a sorceress, uh, we have a rogue, we have a kangaroo murderer, I think is what you are. We have projected dice rolls, we have audience suggestions for the quest. Jesse, you know, writes music on stage and it's just fun. I mean, it's just getting the audience involved, uh, giving out beers when we roll critical hits. Really, there's only a couple other sort of D&D shows in the country that are, that are doing anything close to this. It's all about storytelling. You make it up as you go when you're playing Dungeons & Dragons anyway, so it's not that different from playing Dungeons & Dragons in a basement or something like that. Not that everybody who plays Dungeons & Dragons plays in a basement. That's a <laughs> very pain, pain with a broad brush. A giant talent grabs the king and flies away! Oh my so my hope uh, from the beginning was to take D&D, infuse it with broader improv, and kind of expand it to a general audience. Like I really wanted to reach people who hadn't played the game, as well as people who play it uh, on a weekly basis. Dungeons and Dragons 3 Adventure, room 304, you have two minutes, people! When we started doing this, I had a suspicion that because geeks love things very much, and that if we could, if we could find, you know, the people like us who love things and, and are so passionate about things, that it would help us to create sort of this following. I knew that clearly that there was a way to make it entertaining for people to watch on stage. It took a few shows to kind of work out exactly how the audience was going to be involved and to what level they would be involved and kind of what what that mix would be. We had uh, a really good response uh, at first, but it's just grown steadily to the point where we're selling out uh, every month. We've added midnight shows where we're doing a lot of, uh, of really experimenting with, uh, with the form. People who love this kind of thing we're finding, and, they, and they're very passionate, obviously, about this, so it keeps, it keeps, keeps that growing. Roll the D20. 20! <laughs> So all of these cultists pour out of the uh, out of the side streets and follow you down. I come from a stand-up comedy background and a theater background. Jesse obviously comes from a musical background with improv, and Liz and Mike and John have very strong improv backgrounds. Um, Fred is terrible at everything. Um, uh, <laughs> what's been amazing though is why sort of experiencing these kind of different skills develop into one team to create layer upon layer upon layer with these stories. And, and saying one thing in the moment might get a very big laugh, but if you sort of step back and let something more build, then it can become something even greater. And I think that that's been what the, great, the best experience for me has been, is sort of being able to take that step back and let something else develop that I had never expected. When I was first thinking about the show, it was always in my mind, 
going to be podcast. Like, there's something wonderful about the ephemeral nature of certainly improv. You work rehearsing a show and then you put it up and it's gone after two weekends. And I love the idea that it can essentially exist in perpetuity. The podcast is really a great way for us to start expanding the audience because obviously Pittsburgh isn't the only place where people love Dungeons and Dragons. That's our sort of biggest growth opportunity is using the podcast to find people who love the type of thing that we do as much as we do. One thing that's made this show actually possible is Pittsburgh. It's, it would be really hard to do a show like this in a place like New York or even Chicago. There are audiences for it. There are, uh, it just, it's become, everything becomes so much easier in a, in a city like Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is so welcoming to things like this. We can experiment a little bit. We can do things that are unique, like Dungeons and Dragons on stage. I mean, people in Pittsburgh are very, very open to amazing, interesting, weird things, and, and it's been awesome. My hope for the show is that we can travel a little bit more, meet some more people who love Dungeons & Dragons. I just want to hear more stories about why Dungeons & Dragons has changed their life. It's a confidence builder. Some people have, have said that when they've had nothing else in their life, Dungeons & Dragons was a way for them to really sort of meet people like them, who enjoyed the same types of things, who weren't afraid to, to dive into a, a strange world like this. Creating something that has such a fan following and then creating a show on top of that and building a fan following around that is, I mean, has been really remarkable. There's a little bit of a, if we build it, they will come situation yeah. happening. And, you know, I think that has absolutely happened. We have these theaters existing because people are really interested in the art. Pittsburgh is a great place uh, to foster a budding stand-up scene, and we're starting to make a name for ourselves that way. This is the start of something. Yes. It's been such a cool thing to see how the city has grown with comedy. There's so many more people. All kinds of shows are happening in all kinds of venues. Pittsburgh is known for a lot of things. Steel, football, medicine, and now comedy. You didn't think Pittsburgh was funny? Well, we're about to blow your mind. The Comedy Confluence, this Thursday at 8 on WQED, probably after a Nova rerun. Or a pledge drive. <laughs> <laughs> after a Nova.